Welcome back to Scott L. Miller's Camera Cafe. Today I'm taking a completely different tact and recording out in a beautiful park where there's some kids a ways away. I get a little bit of background noise, but for the most part, it is pretty quiet and relaxed today. I say this right as the music starts playing off in the background, but it was a nice day. It is overcast and I wanted to come out and record a little bit differently. But today I had a topic I wanted to cover because I was just watching Tony Northrup discussing the need for or his desire for a change to the way that cameras are made. Uh, professional cameras, high-end mirrorless cameras, right? We're not talking about like point and shoots, serious cameras, those above $1,500, let's say, uh, to add Android or similar operating systems and, and the hardware and technology from phones to allow for uh, more advanced menu items and uh, user interfaces, and most importantly, computational photography, which of course, mirrorless cameras today have computational photography. That is not something that is not there, but they do not have anywhere near the resources and the capabilities that you would find on uh, an iPhone, for example, or the latest uh, Huawei or, or Xiaomi phones. Right, so, so I wanna talk about this a little bit because this is an important topic and I feel that it is very poorly understood within camera circles why in, on one side, this may be wanted. There may be a lot of people asking, why would I want that? That doesn't sound like interesting things, but is it? Um, and then on the other hand, well, it can't be a big problem to do that. Can it? We have the technology. So I want to talk about this because I work primarily in a field that can answer these things incredibly well and explain why, all, why you want it and why we don't have it. Uh, and I feel I, I fall into a category where I'm kind of uniquely positioned to answer that. And I think this is something that's worth having as a reference because it does feel so important. So let's start with why do we feel we would want this? So the reason that comes up, and I agree with this completely, that there is a lot of features that exist in your cell phone today that we don't have in our cameras and it would often be very nice to have. We would like to have those features. And an example of those features, the most important one to photographers is generally going to be computational photography. And the iPhone 13 is a wonderful example of this. The iPhone 13 is able to, one, be updated throughout its lifetime to add lots of new features. And not that Fuji doesn't do this with their cameras, for example, but the level of new features that you're able to add on your iPhone is dramatically different than the amount that you're going to add through firmware updates for Fuji. Uh, even their, their flagship cameras throughout its lifetime. So that is, is an important factor. Computational photography, like the incredible low light uh, uh, assembly of photons that you're able to do with the iPhone is a wonderful example of where a, a small sensor with a moderate aperture is able to be overcome by computational photography to create some amazing low light photography opportunities that are almost unmatched in professional cameras with, with relatively little cost and can be improved over time. So even if that's not something you've specifically used, there's a good chance you would like to have access to it in your professional cameras. It just gives you more to work with. So that's a really big feature. And I can tell you as an iPhone 13 user, I use computational photography quite often, especially in low light situations, but it does some neat things in other situations as well. And it can be very beneficial. I would love if I could add that to my professional cameras, of course, more is better. A lot of people also want just a richer experience for the end user. If you're using a, a phone, a phone, a regular phone, um, you're going to have a, you know, beautiful touch screen with really high resolution and uh, a lot of ability to just, you know, swipe and just the interface is so robust compared to any camera you're generally working with. That would be nice to bring over as well. And of course, there's uh, connectivity features. My phone has Wi-Fi as well as LTE 4.5G or whatever. Uh, it has Bluetooth. It has all these different things it can store and manage and edit uh, pictures right on the phone. I can upload directly from the phone. I have GPS, all those things really, really well managed. Uh, and it would be great if all of those things could be in my camera so that I don't have to attach it to a phone or just do without those features. Everything could be right on the, the camera. Of course, that would be great to have. So those are, those are the big reasons why we want to bring 
those things into a camera. Some people have also mentioned it'd be great to have an app ecosystem where third parties or even the camera vendors themselves could go out and create apps that go onto the camera to do neat things. It could be processing images in a certain way. It, uh, after the fact, could be post-processing. It could be uh, uh, applications of LUTs or similar uh, uh, modifications of of the images on the fly. Uh, it could be user experience items. There's lots of different things you could do if you could add apps to your camera. So I think it goes without saying that people enjoy using their smartphones pretty heavily for a lot of things. We love that they have really nice cameras on them today in most cases, and we would love if we could merge these worlds and bring those benefits to our professional mirrorless or similar cameras. That's the first piece. Now I wanna talk about why we can't do that. So understanding a professional camera, what sets it apart from a cell phone, mostly comes down to a few key things. One is cost. Another is its longevity. And the third is its ability to take pictures. Now, of course, we know there are hardware differences. The ability to have large lenses, giant apertures, big sensors, sensors bigger than my, my cell phone even is. Granted, we understand those things. I don't have to explain those. You want to have the grip and all the form factor. Sure. And what a lot of people are thinking is that all it is is changing the form factor, adding a lens mount to your phone, and you would have this amazing merging of the two. And that is not in any way the case. The way that the hardware works in a phone is that you have a general purpose processor. People may refer to it as a mobile processor, but in today's phones and for the last more than a decade, the processors and other components in your phone may be custom modified to be in a mobile device, but they are a general purpose machine. They are a processor the same as you would get in a desktop, memory the same as you would get in a desktop, storage uh, drive, a, a SSD, same as you would get in a desktop. Sure, they're put onto a super small form factor. They're a lower power version of whatever, but they are very standard. And so you're basically looking at a desktop infrastructure shoved into something that can fit in your pocket. The operating systems that run on these, iOS for the Apple devices and Android for essentially everything else, are therefore mobile-tuned, mobile-focused, touch interface-focused, general-purpose operating systems. iOS can be used and is in the process of merging with Mac OS to be a desktop operating system. Using it on an iPad with a keyboard gives you a very desktop-like experience. Android is deployed on desktops, not that commonly, but it is a thing. Uh, it is in the process of merging with Chrome OS to be, yet again, a combined operating system across mobile and desktop laptop and, and those types of devices. So these are general purpose hardware and general purpose software that we find in our phones. What we find in a camera is anything but that. Every piece of hardware in the camera, especially the processor uh, and the operating system are custom designed for cameras. The hardware is typically made from ASICs. And even if it's not, it is something akin to an ASIC. An ASIC being a programmable or custom built processor that only has one job. And you see these in other things, uh, mostly in machine controllers in manufacturing or in things like cryptocurrency mining, where this is how they get the best performance for cryptocurrencies. They make a processor that its only job is doing crypto mining. And so they're very expensive, but they are so performant that they make it worth it compared to general purpose processors because they know what the workload is going to be. With your phone, while you know it's going to be a phone, you don't know if someone's gonna use it as a camera, if they're gonna do computational photography, if they're gonna do crypto mining on it, are they gonna play a video game? Are they gonna watch YouTube videos? There's many different tasks. And each of those tasks needs a different set of computational abilities to do its job well. If you, do, if you are, don't know what that's gonna be, you have to make a general purpose processor that has gobs of power and is quite expensive to do so. With an ASIC, with a custom processor for your camera, they know exactly how it's gonna be used and they don't have to write software for many of the functions that they have. Instead, they're able to build it into hardware and get massively faster performance from a much less powerful device. This is important because we know the workload it's what makes cameras work the way that they do. It also makes them last a really long time from a technology perspective. It makes it require many fewer updates and so forth. There's also the mention in the same video by Tony Northrup that 
uh, Android and iOS operating systems are so advanced. They have so much work in them. There's so much cool functionality and APIs that you can hook to. This is an amazing thing. And that is absolutely true. But in a camera, we don't have those things. And his thought was if we had Android and the camera, magically we would have all those things. The operating systems on cameras today are not Android for a reason. Because if you were a camera maker, if you were a Canon, a Nikon, a Panasonic, a Sony, and you had the option of using Android on your camera, trust me, you would, because that would cost a fraction of getting a custom real-time operating system like they actually have. And here's why. You can get FreeBSD or Linux for free. And I'm talking truly enterprise would work great on your camera as well as anything else that is general purpose operating systems among the best in the world. They could just put them on for free with almost all of the work already done for them. People have done it. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. All those APIs that, that Tony talks about, all of those are already in the those operating systems. And making a touch interface or whatever like Android has is a no brainer. It's so easy that it's not part of the problem. It's not part of the challenge. What they need though, is a real time operating system. And that is an operating system where everything that happens in it happens as you do it. When you press the shutter button, it needs to take that picture. As you press the button, no ifs, ands, or buts. It needs to simply take the picture. When it's focusing, it needs to focus at such an unbelievable speed, it cannot be doing anything else. It needs to calculate its lighting uh, and exposure controls extremely quickly. You can't wait while it's doing some other function. With your cell phone, that is completely different. They have lots and lots of time to sit around doing other things. And you will notice that a lot of functions, especially on the cameras, are laggy, very laggy compared to using a physical camera. So I'll compare this to, we'll say, my Olympus EM1 versus my iPhone. If both devices are off and I turn on my iPhone, I have to wait a good 15 seconds for that even to turn on. At which point I can log into it, which takes a few more seconds, sometimes as many as like five or six. Then once it's in, I can go to the camera app, load it again, one or two seconds, and then move it to the mode I want and take a picture. When I'm using my Olympus, I simply pick up the camera, flip the power switch to on before I can look at any of the functions that's already on. I can raise it to my eye and press the shutter button. I'm already taking a picture. I don't have to go through any of those steps. I can do things 20 or 30 seconds faster from off and five to 10 seconds faster than from on on an iPhone. And Android is going to be similar. That lag of 10 to 30 seconds just to take a picture is the difference between getting a great picture, and getting no picture. Right now, if you're going to be taking landscapes, that may not be a huge problem. But if you're doing much else, it is a pretty killer feature that you can simply turn on any time. Other things like that, the ability to simply focus fast, get the, you know, press the shutter and have it happen instantly. The iPhone and those things are pretty decent once you're in camera mode, and especially if you disable all alerts and turn off any networking, put it in airplane mode, you're gonna get a pretty responsive device. But even then, it is never as responsive as the camera, even when you add hardware to make it seem like it would be a little bit more responsive. You're always giving something up. That real-time system is something that Android or iOS cannot offer and are not going to offer. They have no reason to offer. So we have both a hardware difference on the cameras where they have custom hardware that makes what they do possible at a lower cost and allows the camera to, to last a really long time. And we have the operating system that allows it to, to work really quickly. And you have to have a real-time operating system like that to work on those processors. You can't just take Android and put it on that type of hardware. It doesn't work. Android only works on a very specific set of hardware. And uh, iOS works on even less hardware. Very, very few different types of hardware, all made by Apple. So to make a camera use those kinds of existing technologies is out of the question. Now, could you take technologies like Android or uh, iOS and adapt them and make them work on something like a camera? Could you take a camera and build it on general purpose hardware like a phone? In theory, yes. But there's a couple key problems. One is you're reinventing the wheel in all cases and doing something extremely expensive, all for a purpose that doesn't actually make sense. You don't really want all of those things to be how your camera operates. They don't really offer the value that it seems. Cameras already 
have the ability to use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi and other technology to connect to the outside world. In most cases, they're gonna to connect to your, your cell phone in your pocket, and that's gonna do a whole bunch of the heavy lifting for them. For the most part, that doesn't just make sense, it is perfect because that device needs to be updated all the time. It can run really complicated software. It can handle all the diverse situations in your life, such as moving between different countries and having to have different carriers for your uh, LTE or 5G service, all those kinds of things. Also, you don't wanna have apps on your camera. As great as that sounds, the ability to run third-party apps is also the ability for your machine to crash for weight reasons that the camera maker cannot control. It also means almost guaranteed you're going to have lots of laggy situations. Of course, they could deprioritize those apps, but that may defeat the purpose of the apps. Uh, it would also create a giant support nightmare for the camera companies because people would install some app, they would get malware, or they would just have an app that took too much resources or they would put too many apps on. They would then be calling the camera maker saying, I can't take a picture. I press the shutter button, it doesn't take a picture. I go to focus, it can't keep up. Your camera's no good they have to look at it and say, well, actually you've got apps interfering with it and, they, and people will just return the camera. They will not be understanding of the fact that they chose to break the camera. And I worked for most of my career in software engineering and one of the things we know is that end users are bad resources for how to build your products because they won't consider how they'll actually react to the problems they create. And it is very common, I'll give an example that very few people will understand. I know a product that for many years built with a certain type of database and every engineer that I spoke to is like that is the perfect database for that product but end users were constantly like no I wanted to have this database that I like for some emotional reason and they pushed and pushed and pushed and luckily the vendor never made the change but they had to shut down their forums where people were asking for it because everyone was asking for the same thing and they would often give a reason and the reason would be well I need more speed I need more they kept saying things but none of those things were true all of them were the opposite of what would actually happen in the real world. It would require many more resources. It would be extremely complicated. It would create a support nightmare, which would cause a change in the pricing model for the product, all for something that would actually be slower and more, and more buggy than the existing system. But the end users, not being engineers, had no idea what the ramification of those database decisions were and simply would have been upset with the product when it didn't do what they imagined it would do and moved on to something else everyone would have lost had they listened to those end users. Same thing here. If you start putting apps on a phone or, or on a camera and making it have all the problems that phones have, you're going to lose the camera experience that is why we were all buying them. And instead you're going to have a phone that is in a form factor that isn't very usable as a phone. You would end up with a camera that requires a monthly subscription to the uh, cell service. You would end up having to constantly update it. You would constantly be worried about it being attacked because it was on the network everywhere you go all the time. It would be a nightmare. It would be subject to all kinds of import controls that you don't expect because a lot of countries don't let you bring in two phones and it would be a phone it would just be awful. We already have technology that offers almost all of those features. Not the computational photography, but even that could be solved by having device, uh, apps on the devices in our pockets. The phone in your pocket connected to the camera today already gives us essentially all the features that we want in a way that's actually pretty convenient if it works well. Now you may not like your camera maker's apps or how they work, but if you don't like how their apps work today on the phone, taking that phone and putting it into the camera is not gonna make that better. You're simply going to not like that functionality, but now it's gonna be inside the camera instead of just inside the phone. You'll still be tied to it. You'll still want a different product. There are approaches here that could theoretically work. And one is having a completely separate module inside your camera that holds a general purpose processor and a general purpose operating system and has a high speed communications uh, pathway to an existing camera, ASIC and ecosystem of real time. So they're able to do the real time pictures, but do post processing or computational photography on a different kind of processor very quickly. Or simply making ASICs that handle things like computational photography right in the camera and bypassing the problem altogether. These are both reasonable approaches. With these, you may be able to get the things that we desire, the more uh, responsive and robust interface, computational photography, um, all the things that involve a SIM card and Wi-Fi and extra storage and manipulation and even editing in camera. Maybe you'll even have a second screen. 
there's a bunch of things that are negatives about this and reasons why I don't feel it's very likely to be something you will see. One is that it will use a lot more battery and that's already a problem. It's not something that I wanna see happen. It is going to use a lot more power and that means it's go from the battery that I just mentioned, but that means it's gonna generate more heat. We're already at a point where cameras are starting to overheat on a regular basis. This is a major topic of conversation when we're working with cameras. Even my GoPro is gonna overheat. And many of the you know, Panasonic cameras are now coming with active cooling fans on the back because they get so warm. Uh, so that's something we have to think about. You then take all of the heat generated by the latest generation phone and put that inside a camera that's already pushing meltdown all the time. And you're just gonna make your camera unable to function in a lot of scenarios. So that is also something that people need to be wary of. We also have to think about the fact that currently with phones, we're willing to have such an expensive device because it is something we have with us every moment of every day. It is a very special thing in our lives. So spending $1,000 every year on a phone, possible. Doing the same thing as an addition to our camera? Unlikely. If you're worth $100 million, you may not think twice about doing this, but to the average person who is buying cameras, not even the average person, the average camera buyer is gonna balk at wanting to spend any kind of crazy money like that to keep their cameras up to date without actually getting a new camera. But you would need a module, maybe not $1,000, but very close to it because the volume would be lower and therefore the cost for the same performance would be higher you still need the same CPUs, the same RAM, the same touchscreen, the same uh, uh, operating system and licensing and APIs and chips for uh, radio transmission and all those things. So you're not gonna get any real cost savings, no significant cost savings compared to simply going out and buying an iPhone. So for all intents and purposes, you're gonna buy the latest iPhone or Samsung or Xiaomi or whatever and slide the whole thing somewhere into your camera for an additional $1,000. So if you felt that your $1,500 entry level professional camera or even your five or $10,000 professional camera was expensive, imagine adding $1,000 to it. And then if you wanted to use some of those features, you gotta spend $50 a month for cell phone connectivity. Those are big numbers really quickly. That's $1,000 upfront and $600 per year just to have that functionality that technically you already had with your phone in your pocket and the cameras as they are today. Now, some things like building in GPS, so I don't need to pull that from my camera, from my phone, would be great. And I had that back in 2009 when I went to Germany with my Nikon D90. I had already had GPS for my camera for quite some time. So that's not a new thing. Not everybody is doing it, but it is a feature I do like to see that kind of crosses the barrier, but in general, uh, most of these features make very little sense. And the action of putting them into the camera, no matter how much it seems like something we would want, almost always would create a scenario where it would make it a camera we didn't want to buy. And so I think that's important. We have to consider that we're designing a device we wouldn't want in the real world. Do we want all of those features in our camera in a perfect world if there were no compromises, if there was no downside to it? Of course we do. But we've always known that, right? Do we wish that we could have the lower cost of not having any of those things there and all the real world benefits of having none of those features? Yeah, of course we wish it was all that it costs and our battery would last forever and everything. Is there a reasonable compromise that we could do someday in the future if we were brilliant and said, well, how do we marry these thing, two things together without ruining either one? Well, we already have that. We have the camera and communications to the device in our pocket or to a desktop and we can do our post-processing there, we can do our uploads from there, we can do whatever we need to do from those locations. If you can't do that today, putting that same functionality inside the chassis of the phone, of the camera, is not going to fix anything. It's just gonna move where it is and make it really, really expensive with major downsides. I do understand that if we had it inside the camera, there would be a faster communications channel so that in theory we could uh, do some computational photography in real time and that would be wonderful. But that's unrealistic. That one thing would be really nice. I believe the future is going to be additional ASICs that are able to do the computational photography in camera. It'll be more limited. You won't be able to upgrade it later, but I think a lot is just gonna be um, teaching the hardware of the camera what to do in order to send that data to your phone for post-processing for computational photography after the fact. That is an absolutely 
uh, workable solution. It is not perfect, but I would be perfectly happy with it today and would give us greater functionality than any other solution with the limitation of being less convenient that you have to take the picture, wait for it to go to your pocket, wait for it to process, and then look at it. That is obviously not perfect. There is a chorus of dogs going on as I say this, but that is the best we are reasonably going to be able to get. And camera makers know this. In Tony's video, he said that he felt the reason that Japanese companies that make cameras were not doing this is because the Japanese simply don't understand software because they don't do software, they only do hardware. Nothing's farther from the truth. The camera companies know the software well enough to have already looked at these things that Tony thinks simply make sense and determined that they're absolutely crazy and would destroy their cameras. And you have to remember that if they didn't understand software, they would just go out and get Android or iOS, just like Tony suggested. They would put it into their devices and learn very quickly that they did not do something that was good for their cameras. Instead, they built specific hardware and then got very poorly known, so unknown that we don't even talk about their names, real-time operating systems and or wrote their own and built completely custom software to do the job. Let me repeat that. Tony believes that the Japanese don't know software and so that's why they don't do the thing he wants. But the reality is they're doing dramatically more software than they would if they did that. So it's quite the opposite. They're doing too much software for his liking. I understand his, his stance and why he wishes that the cameras work that way, but I don't think he's thinking through, one, what that would mean and all the problems it would bring because you, it's not magic. You don't get the benefits without the drawbacks. But also, he's not perceiving the amount of work that the camera companies are doing to make the cameras do what they do today. That is not to belittle Apple and Google who are doing amazing things to make phones do what they do today. Absolutely they are. They're doing a great job. It's a miracle of science and technology what they're able to do with my iPhone or my Samsung or my, my Xiaomi. I have an iPhone. But it is also a marvel in a different way what Nikon or Olympus or Fuji are able to do with our cameras. But they're doing different things. Each of them is building a specialty device or in the case of the phones, it's, its specialty is its generalism. But in both cases, they're specifically building around a use case that is unique and doesn't cross over very well. Merging the two together would be an incredibly difficult task that would likely come at massively high cost. It would be extremely difficult to do so without alienating your entire customer base, either by making it too expensive or by making it not very good. Thank you for joining me. I hope that you enjoyed another visit here to the Camera Cafe. Next time, I plan on talking about my recommended range of low-cost lenses for the Nikon DX SLR system F-mount. Uh, and I'll be showing that on my D3500, but this will apply to many of the cameras in the DX family. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time. Please remember to like and subscribe. And if you have any comments, feel free to post them below. I'm very good about answering.